I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the challenges of care for these works of um, site-specific artworks and works of uh, land art. And they are slightly different, but they all sort of fall within a rubric of um, being somewhere in the middle between architecture and sculpture. Some of the things that we have to do are more closely aligned with how you deal with buildings in the sense that the land and the landscape form part of the works to a greater or lesser extent, and there's often little or no way around the conditions of the land and the landscape and how they impact these pieces. This is both the power and the challenge of dealing with these artworks when you're um, part of the team that has to take care of them over time. And another division that um, I see in the site-specific works and works of land art have to do with whether they are in urban settings or in remote rural settings. So for example, this phenomenal artwork in Sicily is in a very r remote rural setting. It hardly gets any visitation, although I understand it was just recently completed a few years ago and is seeing a lot more visitors. But for example, this piece, which is very typical of a lot of the work that we see, um, is a site-specific artwork created for a municipality, in this case, Miami-Dade County in South Florida. But this was um, a common, this is a slightly later piece, but it was very common beginning in the 1960s with the GSA Art and um, um, Public Buildings program to have large, massive works of sculpture, often painted, as Suzanne described earlier, that the paint went off the canvas and onto the artworks outdoors. So these artworks of this caliber and this quality and importance exist throughout the United States. And the one thing is that the paint surfaces on these works are sacrificial. That is to say, the color is the aesthetic, but the color doesn't last because paint changes over time. And when these works are repainted, the challenge for us is to make sure that you're getting not only the color, but the texture and the reflectance as intended and migrating forward with the right kind of industrial systems that are now being used for these works. So this piece was treated by our team in 2010. And one of the things we had to do is remove coats and coats of paint that had been put on the surface, usually by, since a lot of these, are, these works are, fall under the, uh, the aegis of um, a municipal public works division, they often hire non-conservators or non-specialists in, in the field of art, although that has changed a lot lately, to repaint, and painting is taking place with sort of approximation to the color system. Um, so you'd have, so we found that the color had shifted so much over time. And you know, it was a successful treatment, but the one thing that we were unable to change, and this is one of the uh, challenges of this kind of site-specific work, is if you can see those large bowl-shaped concrete painted elements are spectacular skateboard ramps. And there's no way around it because one, the artist was adamant, Oldenburg was adamant that the pavement couldn't be changed because if the pavement had been changed to something that was more uh, grass or uh, um, decomposed granite or something where you couldn't actually roll across it, it would have protected those forms but that was not um, an option. And in our case, I, I feel very bound to respect exactly what the intention of that is, even though we might sometimes push at it a little bit if we feel it's in the best interest of the work. This is another example of a similar situation. This is Roy Lichtenstein's first work of public art in the city of Miami Beach, The Mermaid. And this piece, again, underwent the same kind of repainting campaign. You see the small image on your right that shows how the blue had shifted from that sort of deep ultramarine that is the intentional color. This is the, the big slide is after treatment. And it had sort of changed over time by just repaintings that didn't have a strong accountability for what the original color was. And the way we were able to get back to the original color was because the Getty Museum had been working with the Lichtenstein Foundation to, to codify the exact colors that are to be used. And we found a local fabricator that could help us achieve it um, in a kind of unusual way. We had to sort of, that, that deep blue didn't work very well in a commercial paint 
we had to sort of um, get to it by painting a white underlayer and getting thin layers on top of it. And of course, the other thing is this being a fountain piece, um, people use it to bathe in. Um, homeless people in, in, in Miami Beach use it to bathe in. And another um, part of this work of land art, which I, I have to um, chide myself for not photographing it in its entirety, is that the skinny palm tree to, the, to your left is actually part of the work itself. And so that's another component of its care, is to make sure that the palm tree is healthy. So um, this is an artwork that I think everybody here recognizes, and it's, a, it's probably one of the most challenging works to take care of, the Watts Towers in Los Angeles, because for many reasons, but the main is it's in the middle of an incredibly dense urban center. It's also idiosyncratically made, unlike say, um, Nancy Holt, who worked with many um, technical people to achieve her works, the, auth the artist who made this piece made it himself, and he kept changing the styles of it. So I was involved in this project in the late 90s, in the, in the, from, the, from for a decade, the decade of the 90s, and there was a great push to figure out how could we fix them, how could we bring them to a state of equilibrium, and the reality of it is that there wasn't. It was a, it's a work of art that was a work of folk art with no real design or plan. It just kind of got made over time. And what eventually happened is that the Los Angeles County Museum of Art took it under its, um, it under, took over the stewardship of it. And even though it still belongs to the city of Los Angeles, LA County Museum of Art takes care of it and they have a permanent team on site just to do constant maintenance. And of course, any time that they have to you know, bring lifts in or scaffold around those tall towers. It's a huge undertaking. Another um, challenge to these works is when they are designed to have landscape around them that actually damages them. This is um, a piece in a sculpture garden in Palm Beach called the Ann Norton Sculpture Garden. And these works by the artist Ann Norton are intended to look like they are archeological ruins that you just happen to come upon. And so a lot of tropical vegetation surrounding them and touching them and covering them is part of their intention, which of course impacts the pieces in many ways, not just with mold and bird droppings and all these superficial components, as you can see, because ultimately that's part of what they're intended to be like, but also, as you can see in this, it actually creates breakage in the piece to have that much humidity around them. So now I'm going to shift from the urban setting into a more rural setting and look at some works that um, have to deal more with the, the, the desert landscape, those arid landscapes that are really the major um, locale of some of the pieces that we're discussing today. And we were involved in this project about um, 10 years ago. Um, Chinati spent a fair bit of money to redo the foundations for this installation, roughly in the around 2005 to 2009, I think it was. And the undertaking was so huge, and it was only part part of it was only part of the. Um, the conservation plan. The, the plan had several components to it, but the foundation job was so immense that they ran out of money. And so they called us and said, could you solve this problem for us without any money? And <laughs> what we wound up doing is, um, because the, 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 the last component of the work, in addition to the foundation work, was the pieces were intended to be caulked so that water wouldn't be coming in between the planes. And also, they wanted them to be waterproofed because, as you can see in some of, in this image, and uh, oh, here in this image on the lower right, they serve as bat houses, and the bats um, drop all over the surfaces of the um, concrete and stain very badly. So the program that had been developed by someone other than us was to caulk and waterproof the pieces to just protect them a little bit better. We wound up 
creating a plan where we used students to do some of the implementation. Um, that's not a student, that's me. Um, figuring out how to do it. And one of, you know, the, the interesting thing about working in these very arid environments is that when you wet up a surface, it can do funky things to the concrete finish. So we had to first figure out how to wet it so you didn't create tide lines. And actually the secret was to wet from the bottom up so you got no drips as it was running down. Because in order to, to put the water repellent on them that they wanted, we needed to clean them first because they were dirty. Um, and that was the, 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 uh, the, the plan that we worked out. And as you can see, the bit of blue tape that is at the top of that is you didn't want to get the water repellent into the crack because then the caulk would not hold. And here we have a team of students from some of the conservation programs that came out for the summer. That's how we got around the financial burden. Chinati put them up, and they worked for free, as uh, good interns will do. And they caulked the, all those um, um, joints. And they had to be caulked in such a way where the caulk was embedded and then raked out so that it didn't disrupt the line that Judd had intended. So it's in there to protect the space, but you don't see it. And there is a waterproofing test that is being done on the left. And you can see that the finish itself, that is a finished product afterward, the finish itself didn't change. And that was really important to it, to make sure that we applied this without any alteration to the surface. But what we weren't able to do as part of this project is to do any repairs. And the new foundations, even though they were installed shortly before then, there was still a bit of shifting. And what you get um, on some of these large concrete works um, is cracking uh, at the, at the, in various places. So we weren't able to take care of that. There's still more work to be done on this. And you can, I love this shot because it showed the difference of conditions we don't have, there, there in, in settings such as this, you don't have to deal with human beings for the most part doing strange things to the artwork, but animals are around. Um, I'm going a little fast because I have 10 minutes and I know we're running behind. So this year we were extremely privileged to be able to work on the sun tunnels. And um, I had initially gone out to look at the sun tunnels in 2014 when they were still under the, um, the stewardship of the Holt Smithson Foundation. And I was asked to come out to just see what their condition was. And their condition was really quite good. Um, but it, they, they did have a couple of key problems that had to be dealt with. And once Dia acquired them, um, I went out again with um, the registrar, Elizabeth Peck, and we did an inspection of them one more time. And they're, they're really well built. They're in excellent condition. But they did have several um, areas of concern. And the first is that because the, um, because the tunnels were cast vertically, the part that was at the top had a sort of depletion of the, of the matrix of the cement matrix, it's just depleted because it settled down. And those, you could see on every single one of them, those ends, only one end of each tunnel had a lot of cracking and damage and old repairs that didn't look very good. The other side of them was beautifully intact, no cracking whatsoever, but it had a dark stain around them from the mold release agent that was on the bottom. So the main things were those cracks, little bits of graffiti. I, I, I'm, I don't know how uh, it has been thus far, but no one has ever decided to take a can of spray paint to these pieces, which is great. All the graffiti, there is some graffiti, but it's really discreet. Pencil markings, little, uh, I love this one because it was done with just like wet dirt, uh, with wet earth. And then small bits of corrosion from places where the aggregate, from, where the um, rebar that reinforces these was at the surface. And you see, you can see the level of the damage on those sides. And the other thing that was um, happening with them is that there is, on the top of each tunnel, since they were cast vertically and they're now horizontal, the top of each tunnel presented this long crack that ran the entire length of the tunnel. And I, the, the two times that I went out to inspect it, I was absolutely certain that I was seeing light come through it. But I was wrong 
there was no light coming through it. It was a superficial crack from the bottom up, but still we felt it was important to reinforce it, especially, and you'll see in a minute, um, in areas where it sort of spanned two of the cord holes for the constellations. And then there was this other condition on the surface of the tunnels that I would never have been able to identify had Elizabeth not told me what it was. And it is essentially, you see these brown markings throughout the interior. It's that people like to come and shoot bullets into the sun tunnels, but they don't shoot them to, to ping them and damage them. They shoot at an angle to watch the bullets spin around inside the tunnel. But the effect is that because the bullet is hot as it hits the concrete, it creates this sort of smear of brown metal on the surface, which luckily Nancy Holt knew about it in her lifetime and felt that it was okay to leave because it would have been very difficult to remove molten metal from the surface of the tunnels. And probably not um, very efficient, if you will, because there's no stopping anyone from doing it again. Um, that the, the challenge of this piece and the Judd was that when you're out in these incredibly dry landscapes, anything you do to these surfaces that involve moisture wicks away immediately. So you have very little time to really do your work without having someone constantly hydrate the surface, which I'll show you in a second. This is us um, ascertaining carefully from the top that the, the, that crack did not go through anywhere. This is um, us doing a little bit of remedial work just in the area where those cracks spanned two constellation core holes because we were concerned that, you know, in an area like this, ooh, I don't know how I'm doing this, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be working. Well, you can see what I'm talking about. That, that where it spans in between two of those holes, if it, if it continued to crack and it cracked all the way through, then a piece could dislodge. So we routed those areas out and um, reinforced them with uh, stainless steel threaded pins and then filled them. You can see us working using the holes themselves. And we didn't do any repairs to small little spalls of the sort you see up there on the left because the point here was to stabilize and to have an aesthetic that was um, in keeping with the fact that this is a piece of art that lives in an exposed rural environment. This is the patching work. We used um, patching mortars that we typically use in the conservation field of architectural work where you have to do um, patching work on cast stone or friezes or um, concrete brutalist buildings. We use the exact same methodologies here. You can see the shaving of the patches and that is the me in the, in the parka. Um, I live in LA and Miami so I don't do cold too well. So. Um, yeah, the graffiti, that, that was me cleaning off some graffiti because these, these um, tunnels, we were gonna wash them initially, but we realized it was a totally futile thing to do. If we washed them, they would be dirty overnight. So instead we dry cleaned them, and we also removed a lot, the graffiti you couldn't, most of them were pencil marks, but you couldn't erase them out because they were on top of layers and layers of dirt, so the only way you could do it was a fine sanding to get the graffiti marks out. And then this is um, our work to keep those patches hydrated for as long as possible because all of these restoration mortars need to be wet for a long time so that they draw, dry well. So while we were working, we just kept wetting them and wetting them and overnight when we went away, we wrapped them in burlap and plastic and in the morning, of course, they were dry but at least they kept from cracking overnight. And here I'm going to show a video that was made by the artist Marie Lorenz who came out to visit us. It's a short video that just kind of um, shows you a little bit of the work from a drone. And um, the little camper that we have there was our way of dealing with the site because we had no electricity, no water, no bathrooms, no place to get away from the elements or to store our lunch. So that served as our, um, our headquarters out there. You can see this is uh, filling the crack. Lucinda is wetting the crack before she fills it because we had to keep the wet, the concrete wet all the time while we were working. 
and you will see in a minute a dust storm blowing in while we were working. Very surprising. And the dust storm coming at us. We had to pack up all of a sudden and get the heck out of Dodge. Because <laughs> so I think that uh, was it. And then I want to just uh, finish by saying I had the opportunity also after we worked at the sun tunnels to go and do an inspection of the lightning fields, which um, are in beautiful condition, but um, I, uh, for a conservator, it was really interesting to be at a place where photography is really, really not allowed or d discouraged and certainly not allowed. And it really made for a very interesting interaction with the work of art that we were dealing with. Thank you. Thank you.